So camera rolls. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good part of day folks, everyone from every part of the globe. Welcome to the largest, fastest growing and growing and the most active uh, large scale scrum uh, meetup uh, has gone viral ever since uh, from the 2015, we started in New York City and now we're global. Today, we have a very special guest, a very unique opportunity to um, uh, host uh, the gentleman by name Jim Highsmith, uh, who is one of the um, Agile Manifesto co-signers. Um, He's also a co-founder of the Agile Alliance and the first president of the Agile Leadership Network. Uh, he is the one who co-authored the Declaration of Interdependence for Project Leaders. Uh, Jim has more than six, 60 years, six decades of uh, technology experience. Um, immensing himself in rapid technology and uh, fast going business changes. Uh, he goes as far back as 1970s when he used to write in COBOL all the way um, up until uh, nowadays where he has been involved in digital transformations. Uh, there are other assets and, um, uh, and, and, um, and, and awards that Jim has deserved and is willing to um, to share with you if you ask him a question. Uh, but I would like to pass the baton over to Jim not to take any valuable time from him. So the floor is, uh, is, is yours, Jim. Uh, we welcome you here. Thank you for coming out and doing this for us. Everyone else, uh, please uh, keep your mics off and use the comments field to type your questions succinctly to the point. We'll try to go through them as we progress. Uh, and. Um, Keep your cameras on, mics off, as I said. Thank you very much, Jim. Over to you. Thanks, Gene. I appreciate everybody showing up this, <clears throat> this morning, this afternoon, this evening, depending on where you are in the world. I wanted to take a, a little while and talk about a history of the Agile Manifesto. And I really want to emphasize the A because it's not the history. And I think that's really important. It's a history from my perspective of things that I did or things that I was involved in. It, and things that I was not involved in, I didn't include in this history. Uh, and actually, it's it's more of a history than, of the manifesto and more a history of software development of which the manifesto is a part. And I, as I was putting together some presentations for this type of, of um, venue, I thought about the fact that why did and how did 17 adventurous techies change the world? Because if you look at the advent of agile development in the world today, it's pretty widespread. And so how did that go about, come about? So I wanted to get, dive into the history a little bit. And part of what I'm talking about, I've called the roots of agile before agile. The roots of agile were really in the 1990s. A little bit about me. I, I actually started out writing this history as a memoir to my grandkids. And I, it then kind of escaped into something that was a lot larger than that. So this is my daughter on the right and my grandson on the left and his girlfriend in the middle. And so this, as I said, this started out as something just for the family and exploded into a full grown book. Down at the lower left-hand side, you'll see the snowbird ski area where the manifesto was written in 2001. And it's hard to believe that it's been over 20 years now since we wrote the manifesto. I get, sort of amused at times, I'll see something on social media that says, the Agile Manifesto's writer didn't think about X. And I thought, well, we didn't know about X 20 plus years ago, so we didn't write about it. Uh, and as I was writing this book, Wild West to Agile, I got to thinking about the fact that history's role is not to help us predict the future, but to prepare for it. And so one of the things I hope this book does is I help people prepare for the future by understanding a little bit of what transpired in the past. So let me start with an, with an example, with a, with a story. This is about Nike, and this was like circa 1995. And I was asked to come into Nike and, and help them out. They had a project which had been going on in one of their big divisions. And the project had been going on for 18 months. And what they had was a requirements definition document that was out of, that was, uh, that was uh, 
It was no, no longer accurate. And so they were really frustrated, and particularly the woman who was ahead of this particular division that was the customer was very frustrated the fact that 18 months had gone by and a real crying need for something that she needed had not been met. And so this was a common occurrence during this period of time when most people were using waterfall methodologies. And so the lessons I took from Nike and from other people were waterfall, monumental waterfall methodologies was what it was all about in the late 80s and 90s. And they were mostly document driven, uh, procedure driven, lots of process, lots of documentation, lots of diagramming. But the community that was the client community was the IT managers were saying, everything takes too long, it costs too much, and it didn't produce what I needed. And so that was a mantra we kept hearing over and over again during the 1990s. At the same time, there was a big technology revolution. So for example, I've traded stocks a little bit off and on for most of my career. And in the beginning, when I wanted to buy a stock, I used a telephone, an old dial telephone, right? Called up the broker and placed the order, talked to him or her for a little while, placed the order. They keyed it into their system and then called me back with the results of the trade. And then I got a snail mail uh, receipt several days later. That was how you traded stocks in the old days. In about 1994, 1995, that changed. Rather than calling a broker, I pulled up the, the system on, a, on my screen and executed the stock trade right there myself and got an instant referral back. And I had access to all kinds of information. So it was really a huge difference in how people interacted with the, the, their computers. And some of this was a result of the internet and the technology revolution of the internet, object-oriented programming, and GUI interfaces were, were real new around that per, period of time. And so the revolution in technology created a revolution in how we, ad, how we access the, the, the machine. And this sort of, I think, didn't become really clear to a lot of people back then, but it was a real difference because all of a sudden you went from having internal users for your systems to having external users for your system. And, and the whole interface design was very much different. And when you do an inter interface design on internal systems, which tended to be green screen character-based screens, as opposed to Windows and GUI-based screens, it was a whole different environment. And so people were really struggling to get the right kind of mix for those new, two different kinds of environments during the 1990s. And, and at the same time, the culture of businesses was changing. Command control was still the primary way of doing business with things like total quality management, business process reengineering, capability maturity model, and software development. So it was still a culture that was oriented towards command control, but that was changing slowly. So to pick up again on the Nike project, I was called in to help them out. And when I went in to interview the executive in charge of IT, the CIO, or I guess he was the IT vice president at the time, I, the biggest question I had in my own mind was what to wear. Uh, because Nike was a very informal place, but I didn't want to go too informal. So I put on a nice slacks and shirt and wore my red Nike running shoes. And I got the job and the VP said, I noticed you've got the right shoes on. So that was the that was a success. So I got to do the project, and what we did is we did a six month project using one month iterations and used a lot of the techniques that we use today: customer focus group at the end of the each iteration, uh, teams co-located and collaborating, uh, a lot of stand up meetings for for retrospectives. So a lot of the things that we use today in in most of the agile approaches we used in that project. And that project to me was one of the bigger projects I had done to date and convinced me that it, that it really worked. So I was about uh, a half hour ahead of them in, uh, in this project and trying to figure out just how to go about it. And the one of the things I remember clearly is the first um, focus group, the VP of the department that we were building it for sat in. 
And the IT people were really kind of nervous because they didn't think they had done too much. They had, we'd done one iteration. We had a few features up and running and we showed the features off. And before we left, the VP stood up and said, wow, this is really great. I'll never see anything about bad about IT again. And all the IT people just about fell over because they'd never heard anything like that before. And so this was one of the projects that sort of launched me into the direction of, of agility. So this was the situation in about mid 1990s. The lower left-hand column you, corner, you see, this was the technology available at the time. We had GUI screens, we had communication, but you'll notice the communications is, an, is a modem uh, and the modem speeds during that period of time started at 2400 baud and went up to about, I don't know, 30 or 40,000 by the end, of the end of the time. But it wasn't very fast and it wasn't very, uh, people lost a lot of time, the business travelers in hotel rooms trying to figure out how to hook up to the internet through their acoustic modems. One of the things that happened to me during this period of time is I started trying to connect my business world and my uh, athletic world. So I did a lot of mountain climbing and actually wrote an article about the, the similarities between mountain climbing and software development. And that sort of start me, started me on thinking about agile development is an adventurous thing. And if you don't have any adventurous spirit, you're gonna have a hard time doing agile. So this is this period that I call the roots of agile. And it actually, I got started working on my first book, which came out at late in that period of time called Adaptive Software Development. So this I call the pre-manifesto time. So Martin Fowler at the top in the middle here, he and, he and I met in New Zealand in 1977, 1997, I'm sorry. And we were both speaking at a conference down there and realized that we were on a similar track. But Alistair, I mean, uh, Martin and Kent Beck, who's the other person to pick it up here, came out of the object-oriented community. And I hadn't had much interaction with the object-oriented community up to that period of time. And so Martin introduced me to Kent. And then Kent, before Spring Programming was published, he and I exchanged manuscripts. I sent him my adaptive software development manuscript. He sent me his XP manu uh, explained manuscript. And we, we sort of realized that we were had similar directions, similar kinds of things we were doing. And so Kent had a meeting in, or in Oregon in uh, early 2000. And that meeting was basically to promote extreme programming. So a lot of the extreme programming crowd was there. Uh, Kent was there, Martin was there, uh, Bob Martin was there, uh, Ward Cunningham was there. There were a lot of XP people and a few outsiders like myself. And that was the meeting that sort of got Bob Martin thinking about having a meeting of, that was more widely um, participated. So the pivotal manifesto meeting, and there's a lot of been said and, and written about this manifesto meeting, and I'm just going to kind of go over a particular point that I think is, uh, I thought was pretty interesting. One of the things is somebody asked me not too long ago if we had a plan for this meeting. And interestingly enough, we had no plan. We didn't know anything. We didn't have any idea about what, what it was going to produce, if anything. I think some people thought it may not produce much because they just weren't sure. And how are you going to get 17 people together who were sort of independent, iconoclastic, uh, a little bit rebellious? How are you going to get 17 people together and get, make anything happen out of it? We used a pretty much an open space principles concept in terms of we didn't do an agenda until we got there. And we were quite a ways into the meeting before we even thought about something like the manifesto. But it's quite unique, I think. Don't you think it's somewhat ironic that this group of basically 17 techies and the, the things that they came up with first as the first value had to do with people and their interactions and collaboration. It didn't have to do with the technology. It had to do with the people and their interactions. And this came from 17 techies. I think that's kind of ironic that that happened. And one of the things that, that happened is we had 17 people there 
about 15 of who taught classes and facilitated group sessions. So you had 15 or 16 facilitators all trying to facilitate. And so we had to come up, make up some rules. One of which was, is the person at the front of the room got to use their particular facilitation techniques while they were running the meeting. Uh, otherwise we spent too much time talking about process and not enough about content, but that ended pretty quickly. I wanted to bring up this particular instance that Alistair Coburn related to me as I was writing this book and he and I were talking and Alistair's in the board in the lower left hand side and Ron Jeffries is on the lower right hand side. Uh, and Steve Miller is on the upper right hand side. And you can see just from these pictures that Steve Miller was a different kind of person at that meeting. In fact, when he showed up, one of the first things he said was, I'm a spy. Because Steve wasn't really known in the what was called then the lightweight methodology community. Steve wasn't known as part of that community. And so we always all wondered why Bob Martin had invited him. And, and so Steve and Alistair and Ron were sitting down talking amongst themselves during a break in the meeting. And so Alistair related this to me. And Steve was talking about his diagramming techniques and how he was doing all this diagramming for, for different parts of the system. And Alistair kind of looked at him and said, yeah, but we don't think that'll work. And th this is not how our lightweight methodology people think. And Steve said, well, I'm gonna generate the code from the diagrams directly. So I only have to maintain things in one place. And Alistair said, well, that's just the same intent we have, that we only wanna put it down in one place, the code and maintain it in one place, not two places. And so the more they talked, the more they realized that the intent of what they wanted to do was very similar, even though the execution may not have been similar. And so there were a lot of conversations like this among the 17 people to sort of sort through how we each approach a particular issue or a particular value or objective that we had or principle that we had in the manifesto. And so this idea of collaboration amongst basically people who are competitors was I think a part of this particular meeting. And I think this is important that each of the different people there basically had a different business. Uh, most of them did some sort of training. They had methodologies that they were pushing, but they sort of, we sort of set aside the competitive aspect of what we were doing during that meeting and really concentrated on the collaboration part of it to do something for the industry itself. And I think the biggest things to come out of that meeting had to do with building better products and improving the work environment. Work environment. So product or software first, and then the working environment, getting people to have more satisfaction and fun at work. And as you know, the manifesto has, has four values. And these can be interpreted in a little bit different ways by different people. As you, you've looked at any of the social media over the last 10 or 15 years, you realize that there's different interpretations of some of this. Some people didn't think we wrote enough down. Some people thought we wrote too much down. Some people thought we didn't go into some areas particularly well, uh, like product management, and that's true. So we needed to add something to, or somebody needs to add something about product management. But what we did do is, number one, the values are outcome oriented. What's the outcome of the process? What's the outcome of the, of the work? And in software, it's the code. Up until then, the code was thought of as just merely a byproduct of all the analysis and design work. And the coding was just something we did at the end of the life cycle that kind of anybody could do. And it sort of, so this, the manifesto sort of reversed that and said, no, it's the final coding and testing that's the most important because that actually puts the product out the door. And the other pieces are necessary, but they're not necessarily more important than the development work itself. And that was a real big change right back then. Remember, we're talking about 22 or so years ago, and it was a very different environment. And there weren't very many, quote, lightweight methodologists out there. There were mostly heavyweight 
methodologist and what I call monumental methodology methodologist. So it was a very, very different environment back then. Uh, and you can see the explorer in a cave. So part of the manifesto was about exploration. And what I, the difference I usually use or the words that I usually use to uh, illustrate the difference in, in, the, in the previous years, it was a plan and do environment. You plan the work out in detail and then you did it. In an agile environment or in a new environment, you explored into the, you, you envisioned where you were trying to go and then you explored into that vision. And so change and not following the plan in detail was just part of, part of building what, you, what the client really needed. All too often in a waterfall environment, what you ended up with, the client said, yeah, that's nice. You've been working on that for two years. That's not what I need anymore. When you deliver in a couple of, in a month, in two weeks, in hours, you get feedback from the client right away about whether it's working or not. A big part of the Agile Manifesto talked about collaboration and getting people together and getting them to collaborate. And that's one thing we did in that particular meeting. And so there are meetings of various and sundry different types in most of the Agile methodologies. Some people have complained that there are too many meetings. Well, if there are too many meetings and they're not meeting your need, reduce them. Take some of them out. Do only the ones that you really need to do. And then finally, we really looked at the voice of the customer to be involved in this, not because we had a contract with the customer, but because we needed some close affiliation with the customer in order to make sure that the right stuff got done. So we really focused in on the customer. It wasn't all work. There was some play involved in this. Uh, this is Alistair Coburn and myself at the top of the uh, gondola at Snowbird. And we spent about a half day skiing. Alistair and I both lived in that area at the time. So we were really familiar with the ski area. What about after the manifesto? I break, break the 20 year period, 22 year period after the manifesto into three separate periods. So the agile era broke down into the rogue team era, the courageous executive era, uh, and period and the digital transformation period. Rogue teams was a time, and this was early on, where we would go in and work for a particular team and it tended to be small teams in an organization who somehow got dispensation to try all this new agile stuff. So we did it kind of one team at a time. And one of the things that happened, we'd have two or three or four rogue teams that were very successful in an organization, but it didn't catch on with the rest of the organization. It sort of died at that point in time. Uh, Josh Kiriewski tells this story about a rogue team that he was working with in Florida and it was being very successful. And some of the other teams in the department got jealous. And so this team came back to into work Monday morning into their conference area, which had all the posters and cards and everything up on the wall and everything was gone. And the team that was dissatisfied had come in and taken all their documentation away. And they had to go find out how to recover it. So the rogue team, it, it, um, Mike Cohn tells me a story about going into an organization one time and the VP of IT said, yeah, I've got three teams that are trying out Agile. And so Mike went and visited with the teams and came back to the VP uh, later that afternoon and said, I found four teams that were doing Agile. And so one of the teams was doing Agile, but the VP didn't even know about it. So they really were kind of rogue at the time. Then what happened about 2004, 2005, 2006, was you started getting VPs of engineering and VPs of development interested in applying Agile to their whole organizations. And you had a few people that did it right. And it really was driven from the top down, whereas the rogue team era was really driven from the bottom up. So finally, these courageous executives, because at the time they were very courageous, really looked at how do I implement Agile in my whole organization. And what I'm gonna do in terms of describing these things a little bit is I'm gonna do a couple of uh, case studies. And then finally, the digital transformation era. So this was one of my, probably one of my favorite all time, 
projects. This was at Alias Systems in uh, Toronto, Canada. And this was in the early 2000s, around 2002. And their primary product was an animation tool that most of the major movie studios used. So you walk down the hall of this particular company and all you saw were these big posters of movies like the Lord of the Rings it was big. They were working on that at the time, although they couldn't really tell anybody about it. It was one of those, I could tell you, but I'd have to shoot you kind of deals. Um, and Alias Systems, so their main product was about 30 or 40,000 lines of C++ code. So it was a very involved product. And so what they wanted to do is they wanted to get into the retail market. And so they wanted to do this using Agile. Their, their guy that was the head of architecture really wanted to bring Agile in for this particular project. So this was a project to put some software. They wanted to put a version of their animated, of their drawing tool on a tablet. And their fixed deadline at this point, which was about six or seven months later, was a Microsoft uh, tablet PC operating system launch. So they had a fixed date. And so what they said is, do we think we can put together a product with about half a dozen people and have it have the features we wanted in about six months? And so they did. They went ahead with the project. So the plans, the architecture, the products kind of co-evolved in two-week development iterations. So they didn't have a really long upfront planning effort. They had a fairly short one. We developed every two weeks and we had a review every two weeks. And as, as the project went forward, it, it was it, it evolved based on the, an evol solely evolving vision of what to do and what not to do. One of the interesting things that happened on this project was they were really adamant about their testing. So it was a very high quality system. They were adamant about testing and refactoring. And so they got to the end of the project, and just as they had, as you see with many projects, they had to do a little rushing at the end. They didn't get to do some refactoring they wanted to do, and they didn't do some testing that they wanted to do. So rather than just let it slide, they went back to management and said, we need three weeks more work to bring this product back up to where we think it really ought to be. And they got, a, they got permission to go ahead, although I think there was some reluctance from the management's perspective. But what happened was about a month after that, the marketing department came in with a hurry product uh, uh, proposal to do some additional features on the particular product that were really necessary for international work. And so they were able to do that very quickly because they'd gotten rid of the technical debt that was in the system. So this was one of the things that was very different from most projects. This was one of my favorite, another favorite project. This is probably my favorite senior courageous executive project. So this was with a company called Syax, uh, again in Canada. This was in this, yeah, this was in Toronto also. And here's where we started. This is a quote out of my book that was quoted to me by the software development manager in 2004. This was what they were up against. Unstable software was a huge problem for their big pharma drug discovery and development customers. Their software crashed. They often lost an experimental drug sample that took weeks to create. They even had competitors in their marketing materials with slogan, had slogans like, our software won't crash, kind of indicating that my client's software would crash. And so this was a state of affairs. Just to give you a state of a, an idea of the, the quality of the software at that point, the technical debt in that software, Josh Karieski, who worked on this for me, spread out on the floor a printout of one of the methods of one of their objects. And that printout was about 15 pages long, spread out on the floor. And that was the method for in one object. And it was one method. And so it, they were basically doing sequential design using object-oriented programming. Uh, and so it was, it was a real mess. And it took them a while to get past that. So we, we developed a work area for the software development team. And we went to work, Josh did the technical side and I did a lot of the project management and management side. And they started really improving their software. At some point in time, when the software had been, software development had been going well, 
for about 18 months. The guy who is the product development manager on the product side, on the hardware, hardware and software side, said he wanted to use this agile technique to do their next big hardware project. That's a pretty courageous move back then is to try to do that on a combined hardware software project because these instruments are very expensive. And so we did a kickoff meeting and you'll see the kickoff meeting down to the left. And what's interesting about that is that some of those people in the room are software engineers, they're electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, systems engineers, biologists, PhD biologists and PhD chemists. And so you had a real cross section of a lot of different people. And we spent a week in, in this room You'll notice the timeline on the board. That's a span of about, about three years, which sounds a little odd for an Agile project, but you're, you have to realize we're building product in this time frame. We're building hardware, not just software. And this was one of the more successful projects they'd had. So this courageous executive really stood out and took and took a took a risk of some sort, which is what courageous executives have got to do. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk much about digital transformation. Uh, if you have some questions about this, I'll answer them. I'll just go to one piece of this. On the right-hand side, you'll see some of the things that I think are important in a digital transformation. And these are incorporated into the previous book that I did called Edge on, on digital transformation. And on the left is Jurgen Apollo's unfixed model. And the reason I put it up here is because this is a really different view of organization. And so I call it the Lego block approach. And, and it's an organizational model that's very, very flexible. And you can replace and, and recombine the Lego blocks to, to depend, depending on your type of project, your type of organization. And so there are things that are like this that are organizationally oriented as opposed to software development oriented that are important when you're doing some sort of digital transformation. transformation which is a business transformation, not just an IT transformation. So it got me to asking the question, why? Why did this meeting of 17 techies change the world? What was it about the manifesto that changed the world? And one of the things that happened as a result of the manifesto is Ward Cunningham put it up on the, on the web, the manifesto and the principles but he added one more thing to it that was really brilliant, and he did it on his, on his own, is he put made a way for people to sign up and say what they wanted to say about the manifesto. And they, so they could write just their name, they could put a little quote, they could write a paragraph, and basically be additional authors or commenters on the Agile Manifesto. In the first 10 or 12 years, we had 15,000 people sign up, and they continued to sign up until they had to take it down because they were getting too much uh, spam messages in there. But I think the reason that Agile transpired in the world like it did had to do with the fact that for whatever reason, it was inspirational and aspirational. People really bought into it. Those 15,000 people that signed up for the manifesto really believed in the concept and the values of agility. And so it, it really, I think, is, behooves us today to think more about why was the Agile Manifesto so important? And as we move forward, we've got to make some changes, you know, technology changes, business changes, things like AI come in. So definitely some of the methods and tools are going to change. But what stays the same? And one of the things I like to say is that Agile methodologies may change, but the need for agility is going to be with us for a while because we've got some big problems to take care of. And some of these problems are bigger, bigger than we are. They're, they're bigger than just software development. They're world problems. And one of the things that we've done over the last 20 years is we've learned how to be more agile. And maybe some of what we've learned can be appro appropriated and used at, at even uh, to address other issues. So my challenge to the current agilists are to understand a little bit about the history so that we can, we're not there to predict the history, but it'll help prepare us for the future. How do we instill agility and adaptive leadership into our enterprises at all levels, not just at software development level, but all the way up to the CEO level? 
How do we instill this agility in a larger audience? And then I think we've lost a little bit of the inspiration for Agile. So how do we try to rekindle that? And with that, I'll give a little promo and then I'll turn it back over to Gene. Uh, Jim, thank you very much, folks. By the way, I, you know, Jim, you beat me to the punch. I always recommend uh, stuff that I have my own in my own pocket. This is not a pocket size, but this is a great book to buy. All right, this is Jim's latest um, publication. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. Uh, folks, the flow is open. Uh, we got about 20 minutes. We're gonna have to time box ourselves. So please shoot it well, ask questions. Best if you do this quickly, briefly by voice. I got one right up top. Okay, John. Okay. This is this is Ryan. Jim, I have to say I'm so inspired by your history. It gives me faith in what, what you and the 17 others had have, have done at Snowbird. In this age, and my question, in this age of DEI representation and all the social conversation about it, a lot of criticism has been laid against the agile movement as 17 old white guys on a ski trip and is not fit for our current social environment. And one critics most stridently by this professor at UCLA, Miriam Posner. How do you respond to that kind of criticism? Well, I think the criticism is, is valid, number one. Uh, you know, it was pretty much a non-diverse group of people that did that. I'm not sure that that means that the result of that is, is not valid. And one of the things that I tried to do in the book is I've got a couple of whole sections that talk to the issue of DEI and that we need to be more aware of those kinds of things. And, and for, for me, example, for example, I can't be at the forefront of that, but I can be an ally to the movement in any way that I can. And so I'm looking for ways to be an ally as opposed to people who are in one of those groups that, that has um, undergone some, some you know, systematic trauma. systematic trauma, yeah. Uh, either my, micro or macro, they're the ones that have to lead, but I can help, I can help be an ally. And that's what I've tried to do. And I brought some of this out in the book and, and it's in the, in the afterword of the book is where I really describe the fact that, that this is something that is really important, uh, and we need to move forward with it. So I, I'm not sure that it would impact how we went about writing the manifesto. I don't know if it did much different, but I think it, it would the words themselves might not be different, but the impact would be different if we had had a more diverse group. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, moving on, anyone else? Uh, just uh, Peter, Peter Stevens, share that well. Okay, so first of all, thank you very much for this very enlightening talk. I've been taking very, very close notes. Um, one question that I had is that there is a, um, um, you know, people have been trying to apply agility beyond software, or discussing agility beyond software. And so we kind of have the question, you know, what does it mean to be agile? Um, you know, if you're not doing software development, maybe you're doing hardware development or leading a company. Um, my understanding is you guys were kind of asked to refactor the manifesto to make it more applicable or more relevant to, you know, other situations. And somehow it seems to me like refactoring is a basic skill of software developers. And so I'm kind of wondering why you were resistant to the idea of refactoring the manifesto to make it or to put, put out a refactored version, uh, which might be more broadly applicable. Well, so, number, number one, I think getting, there have been a couple of attempts to get that group of 17 people back together for a reunion. And that happened at the 10 year anniversary at the Agile conference. And since then I've been involved in maybe two or three conversations among the 17 people. And I would hate to try to do the manifesto over again. We would never get agreement, number one. Number two, it addressed the problem that we just talked about earlier. That wasn't a very diverse group. If we did it, if it, something like that happened again, you'd have to bring other people in there to get a much more diverse group of people involved in that. And the other thing was, remember that when the manifesto was written, the lightweight methodology community was ultra small. And look what's happened to it today. We have the Business Agility Institute. We have the Personal Agility Institute uh, here. <laughs> hey, Peter. Um, 
And, and we have various, you know, we have two big scrum organizations. We have the Agile Alliance, you know, depending on whose numbers you look at, 75% of the people, developers in the world are using some form of Agile. Uh, doing that again today would be nearly impossible. And I don't think it would be very useful. I think, I think we may end up with each of those big groups revising the manifesto for their own use. And revising the manifesto for individual use or for an or organization's use is, is, is fine. I, I have no problem with that. In fact, I did it myself. When I wrote my project management book, if you look at the project management book, the values that I talk about in there are different words than the words in the manifesto, but they convey some of the same meaning about collaboration and exploration and those kinds of things. So they have the same underlying core meaning, but it's different words. I, I get a lot of complaints or hear a lot of complaints from the product management community that we didn't talk enough about product management. Product management wasn't something you talked about in 2000. You know, it, it, you, you did in software companies, but in IT organizations, there was no talking about product management or product owners or product anything. So I think one of the things that the, Agile, that the manifesto did, particularly Scrum, is it brought out this idea of a product owner and product management. And that's something that was new and not in, not, not specifically in the manifesto. And that's a great addition. It needed to be added. Uh, but we didn't we didn't do it back then, and I and I don't think we would add it again. So I would I would advocate uh, several different editions of a manifesto for each of those different groups. And I think the, the part of that question was, can can agility be scaled to a corporation? Oops, where is it? Let me show you a book by one of the. But from what I've read, one of the best agile leadership leaders that I've found. And one of the things I did, I, you know, we as agilists sometimes get involved in saying management doesn't understand, right? Management doesn't understand. There's idiots up there. You know, if they just did it right, we would re really be back on the right track. Well, let me show you a manager, who, a manager who did understand. And this was a CEO of IBM and a new book. Let's see if I can get this up here. Hold it still enough that it'll come out. Anyway, it's called Good Power by Jenny Romady. And I started reading this book and I thought, wow, this woman understands agility at the top of a big corporation. And it got me to reading several other books by CEOs because I think we in the Agile community try to push up our Agile ideas to the EC levels and maybe what we ought to do is listen to them pushing down to see what they really think about agility in organizations. So I've read a half a dozen books recently by CEOs of major corporations. And you would be, I was surprised at how agile many of them sounded. So that was a long way to answer that question. Thank you. Okay, but thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, may I go to Hollis? Uh... Dawson, which, uh, if I may, if I apologize. actually, I believe um, Hong was first. Okay, then let's go to Hong. I can't see the uh, order. Thank you, Hong. All right. Thank you so much, Jim. Jim, thank you so much for being here and share your wisdom. I just actually just want to make a comment because uh, so Rijang made a, a comment on the DNI. However, from my aspect, I, I feel that, that even though on one aspect that uh, when people look at the 17 middle age white men, they don't see diversity. However, diversity is way more than just the race, right? Just the skin deep. You also have the diversity in experience. You have the diversity in your thoughts because you did mention people are from different, uh, have a different profession. And then you guys uh, don't believe in the same thing when you first met. So there are a lot more to the, just the skin color. So just want to make that comment. I agree. Uh, who was next? Just to be um, fair to everyone. Holly, see you and then yes, Jeff. Yes, that is me now. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I wanted to echo that. And I wanted to say as, you know, a woman in technology and in the world, the agile community is certainly very women friendly and welcoming. And so I feel like the community itself is diverse. I have loved the Agile Manifesto. I believe in it. I um, liked what you said about 
um, adapting it to individual teams or individual projects or your own company. I think that's wonderful. Sometimes when I am teaching Agile, I, first of all, always like to go back to kind of present what, what it was responding to. So I thought this um, presentation was very useful. But I always wonder if you, uh, Jim, ever look at what has come out of Agile Scrum, what I might call Agile Evangelists, and thought, no, that's exactly the opposite of what we were trying to get at. Many times. <laughs> but I always I always go back to the very important words of Jerry Weinberg and his law of raspberry jam, which is the wider you spread it, the thinner it gets. And so the wider you spread agile, if you if you think of agile as being used some way or the other in 75% of the companies in the world in the software development field, some people are going to get a very small knowledge or little knowledge. Some people are going to use it wrong. Some people are going to do what I call prescriptive agility, which is an oxymoron. But there's some people that are doing that. And I just think about this the other day. Would you rather they do prescriptive agility or waterfall? And I and so you you gotta you gotta I think make allowances and, and I think what we need to look at things that we don't like and and try to change them. And, but look at, look at each individual organization, each individual project team, and try to see how, how are they getting better? How do, how, do they, how do they widen their knowledge of agility rather than saying they're wrong? Because a lot of times, I mean, I've seen lots of stuff out on the web or the social media that says the Agile Manifesto Steiners said X. And I thought, no, they didn't say X. And so... <laughs> In fact, far from it. And, and I just kind of quit responding to most of those. Uh, a little bit earlier in the year, there was a, somebody on, on LinkedIn who wrote a, a bunch of stuff about questions about agile methodologies. And I wrote back and I said, these are the same damn questions we were getting 20 years ago. Can't you come up with any new questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for that one. Uh, let's move on to save time. Uh, I think Jeff was next. Jeff, good to see you. Yes. Uh it was great to see uh, how early you, you had an example of applying agile mindset to hardware and some of those more challenging realms outside of software. What what do you think was what are some of the key success principles for somebody who's wanting to, to take these agile way of thinking into those difficult environments? You just have to put your thinking cap on because you know there's been a lot more work done in that area by some people although I haven't really kept up with it. But one of the things we ran into was, for example, was there's a point at which you have to build hardware. So there's a point at which you can't change things anymore. And that's not true with software. You can change you know, feature sets right up until the end in many circumstances. You can't change the architecture, but you can change the feature sets. But in hardware, you've got a point in time where you have to sort of nail it down and say, this is what we're gonna build because some of the parts, for example, particularly for high-end medical instrumentation that we were working with, you might have an 18 month lead time to get a part. And that was one of the reasons that chart on the board was so long was because of lead times. And so interestingly enough, in that collaborative effort, one of the most important people in the room when we got to that laying out the timeline was the purchasing agent because he knew how long it took to buy things. And that was a big factor. So I think you have to, be careful how you implement it. So one of the things we implemented, we implemented a lot of the collaboration techniques. We got together in the beginning to do a kickoff meeting. One of the other interesting things that the develop, that the software development, I mean, the product man, development manager did is when he, he showed up at the end of the week, week session, he, he kicked it off in the beginning and then he came back at the, on Friday afternoon to say, to, to get a report of how things had gone. And before, before he let everybody go, he said, now we've made a change that I want to tell you about. When you go back to your offices, you no longer have individual offices. We have a big bullpen that all the engineers are going to sit down in, software, hardware, mechanical, electrical, physicists, everybody involved in this product is going to sit in the same area. And that was a huge change and a huge risk that this guy had. 
The one thing that we never really got to do, we, ne we never got the electrical engineers to do pair electrical engineering. Hmm. Hey, that's a fine, that's a joke. Jim, thank you very much. Jim, by the way, before it's too late, uh, you can say hi to John Curran, the, uh, the partner in crime back in 2001, he's there walking somewhere you can see on a treadmill. I saw, I saw his name come across. Hey, John. Yep. Uh, let's move on to, I think Nicholas was next. We'll take another, another one after. Thank you, uh, Jane. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, please. Thanks. So uh, yeah, Jim, thank you for your work. And John, you know, thank you for being on the call as well. It's a, it's a pleasure, uh, you know, learning from you guys always, all the time. Uh, Jim, I had a question. So uh, regarding the, um, the, the product management side of things, uh, so uh, like what else would you add in, uh, in Scrum or less, for example, uh, from the product management perspective? Like I'm using as a Scrum master, I'm using the uh, Scrum values and the Agile manifesto to coach my product owner. But what else would you add, uh, you know, to uh, let's say less on a large scale organization or into Scrum, you know, for the team uh, uh, environment? I don't have much experience with the current product management community. There are people on the on LinkedIn who are sort of wired in and do a lot of product development types of things. And I would defer to somebody like that as, as, because I just don't know enough about some of the current work that's being done. Uh, I was a product manager at one time in the late 1980s and before anybody knew what a product manager was. And, so I've been one, but not within the last 30 years. So I, I, I feel that's one area that I don't feel competent to comment in on. Thanks for, for the answer, Jim. Thank you for the straight answer. Uh, thank you for the question as well, Nicholas. Uh, let's just move to Marshin. If, if, and then, is it Paul or Marshin? Yes. One of you guys uh, is first. Go so uh, uh, thanks, Jean, and uh, thanks, Jim, uh, for the wonderful talk. So. Uh, my question is related to a very common misconception because most of the time I've worked with a lot, I have worked with a lot of teams and uh, even interviewed many professionals. So the major problem is actually understanding the agile. Uh, I know that that manifesto was written for uh, agile software development, but the overall market misconception of the understanding of word agile is actually very, very different. Most of the people they even don't know about the real agile software development. Even I have seen, even I've gave many talks about agile camouflage, like take an example, the companies are laying off their employees and they are mentioning we are going agile and we need less people. And similarly, you have seen a lot of, uh, like there's one of book like doing the double uh, twice a work and half the time and these kind of different uh, like uh, statements and misconceptions about the agile. But the actual principles and the values, those are written in the manifesto for agile software development. These are a bit different. Mostly people, they, they are thinking agile is some kind of scientific thing. There's a, uh, one lady, I was actually in a talk, she was mentioning it's a psychology. So uh, what about the author being the author, one of the author? What do you think, how to clear this kind of misconception in the market? Because uh, once I, where I see like the whole agile community, they are even not understand the principles those are mentioned in the manifesto. These are, this is something that, this is, these are law of assumptions. And that's actually leads to a lot of, you can say, failed transformations. Well, it, it, there's always a matter of how do you get information out there that's the correct information, that's better information, and get people to absorb it. Some people are going to take that information and do with it what they want. So if you'll notice, I had a slide in there towards the end that said, basically, it was a challenge to the current generation. So I, I want to challenge the current generation of agilists to figure out ways of rejuvenating what I think the passion was all around in, in 20 years ago. Because I think there was a lot more passion and interest in doing something different then than there is now. What I see now is a lot of splintering. And what I'd like to see happen is a lot of that coming back <clears throat> together. And let's focus on the real problems that we've got in software development and in the world and in organizations, let's focus agility on those kinds of things and, and do it the right way. To me, that, that's a legacy I'd like to be, help build on. So 
Uh, I'm trying to figure out a venue to help do that, to help launch kind of a rejuvenation movement. That, uh, I think we can take one more question before we have to start wrapping up. So just to be fair, um, Paul, you're probably the last one we're going to entertain. Paul, okay. Hey, Gene, thank you so much. And Jim, thank you as well. This is fantastic, great opportunity. Um, Jim, you, you mentioned that Scrum, all these different big companies that you were involved with, do you see um, scaled Agile frameworks or scaling of Agile, different frameworks that are out there as an improvement? Is that a momentum? Is that something that maybe just Scrum is good the way it is? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Are, are we moving in the right direction in terms of improvement? Yes, in some ways and no in other ways. I think anytime you've got two types of methodologies, you've got what I call prescriptive methodologies and generative methodologies. Prescriptive methodologies try to talk about all the things you need to do and all the documents you need to make and all the processes you need to put in place. And, and then they go, they go ahead and say, and if you've got a smaller project, you scale it down. That process of taking things out of a methodology and figuring out how to scale it down is something I've seen not work very many times because people say, you take any piece of that and you say, is, would it be important to do this? And you say, yes, yes. And pretty soon you've got most of the methodology there. And I think that's one of the problems with these big frameworks. The other side of it is what I'll call a generative methodology. And a generative methodology is something like extreme programming in the beginning or scrum in the beginning in which you had a minimal set of things to do and then as you needed other things that were you drew them in so for example that's how devops got started people were doing agile development they were looking at the at the last you know the last uh, part of it and they said how can we make that go faster to match to match with the methodology piece and devops emerged and some of the people uh, that were in, in involved in an early DevOps development were people out of the Agile community. So that was a part of a generative methodology that says, now we need X, let's bring X in. And I think there's two, two different ways of going about that. The, the prescriptive methodologies appeal to big companies and for all the reasons that we know. The problem with that is to me, the problem over the next few years, the next decade, are not gonna be scaling agile methods, it's gonna be scaling innovation to meet some of the problems that we have. And so if, we, if those prescriptive methodologies don't help us scale innovation, they're, they're not doing what they need to do. And I think that's the challenge with these uh, frameworks. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I do want to just be conscious of everyone's time and uh, mainly, uh, of course, of, of the speakers. So, Jim, and I want to thanks move. everybody for showing up. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Great Adam. questions. Thank you very much. First of all, before we all disengage, Jim is uh, very available and transparent on LinkedIn. You can pick him up there. We're going to have this recording available within the next 24 to 48 hours for everyone to replay and share. And uh, uh, once again, thank you for coming out. It was a great audience here, uh, really good turnout. And once again, Jim, I wanna thank you for doing this, uh, coming out, sharing your wisdom, sharing some uh, history that not everyone maybe could be privileged to. So uh, thank you. And uh, of course, your latest book that you have published, I recommend to everyone, it's in the chat window. Please uh, go and take a look. Uh, that's probably something worth picking up, okay? Uh, once again, um, thank you, everyone. Happy um, Happy Friday, and uh, let's last ping in the chat before I close. Copy paste what's there, all the reference links, and um, I'm going to wrap this up. Once again, thank you.